All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Julie Creech Morgan. It's my pleasure to be your moderator tonight as we learn from Dr. Andrew, Andrew Peterson about cycling medicine. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to highlight a couple of things moving forward. Um, so our upcoming lecture next week at this exact same time, 830, is going to be Upper Extremity Peripheral Neuropathies by Dr. Dan Cushman. Um, so please join us at that time. And then for those of you who are new to joining us for the National Fellows Online Education Committee um, lectures on Wednesday evenings, uh, the purpose of these lectures is just to serve as an adjunct to your individual programs, educational programming, to provide you access with um, educational experiences of AMSSM members and sometimes some additional invited guests um, in a variety of formats and assist you with your CAQ prep. Some ground rules throughout tonight's lecture. We ask that you mute your uh, device's microphone and turn off your chat or your, uh, excuse me, your video. Um, if you do have questions that arise during the course of the lecture, please feel free to submit those via the chat function. I'll be uh, monitoring that and then we'll have some time for a live Q&A session with Dr. Peterson at the end. So now let me introduce our speaker of the night, uh, Dr. Andy Peterson. So Dr. Peterson is a team physician for the Iowa Hawkeyes and the director of the primary care sports medicine. He completed his undergraduate training at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin, and his medical training at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he then went on to complete his residency in pediatrics and his fellowship in sports medicine. Additionally, he has completed a research fellowship as part of the National Research Service Award and completed a Master's of Science in Population Health. He is a professor, a professor um, at the University of Iowa in the departments of both pediatrics and orthopedics. His primary clinical uh, interests include pediatric concussion and care for the combat sport athletes. Currently, he is conducting research in concussion and injury epidemiology and football players. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Peterson. Thank you. I'm gonna try to get my screen to share here. Do you guys see that okay? Looks great. Looks good. So yeah, so my name is Andy Peterson. We're gonna be talking tonight about um, cycling injuries. Uh, I'm gonna frame this a little bit differently than maybe some of the other lectures in this series. Uh, it, it's really more practical, almost the way that like a bike fitter or someone that actually works with cyclists daily would think about these things. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of the injuries, a lot of things that come up here are things that are easy to read about, you know, working through some CAQ board review book, you're going to be able to read most of the things you want there. So I want to make this a little bit more practical and a little bit more of a way to kind of wrap your head around some of the things you might see in the clinic when a cyclist comes in. Uh, I do have a few disclosures. Um, none of them are pertinent to this talk. Um, some textbook royalties. My wife gets some consulting royalties or consulting fees, and then I've got a few ongoing grants. Um, we're going to do, we are going to cover trauma, but we're going to go over real briefly and talk about some of the real specific things related to cycling. Um, you know, any, any traumatic injury that can happen to anybody anywhere also seems to happen in cycling, but there's a couple of specific ones that I just want to make sure we spend a, a little bit of time talking about. Talk about overuse injuries. Some we'll talk about nerve compression syndromes, and then we'll finish up by talking about bone health a little bit because that's still a bit of a hot topic and how it relates to cyclists. Um, so first of all, uh, a lot of cyclists have broken their collarbone. There's kind of a joke about this. There's two types of cyclists: those who have had a clavicle fracture and those that will have a clavicle fracture. Uh, extraordinarily common injuries. The reason I want to bring it up and just comment on it briefly here is because the management of these in cyclists has changed quite a bit over the past um, you know, decade or two. Um, you know, a, a lot of the ones that in other athletes or in kind of gen pop folks uh, that we wouldn't consider fixing, we're, we're fixing these in, in cyclists for a couple of reasons. Um, cyclists are generally able to get back on the trainer doing indoor training pretty soon after an RIF. And so uh, we're definitely erring on the side of fixing clavicle fractures in cyclists a lot more than we even were a decade ago. Um, and, and you see this if you follow cycling news stuff at all, you know, like uh, someone will have a crash in a race and they'll have surgery the next day. And then the next thing you read is three days later, they're back on the trainer starting to train again. It's pretty remarkable how quickly people can get back on the bike, um, you know, in a fixed position where they're not really using their arm that much. Um, to start training a little bit after one of these injuries. And so the way we've approached those has changed quite a bit. 
Um, so when you have a cyclist with um, a clavicle fracture, even something that you might not think of as an operative fracture, and they come in, you know, talking about surgery, that's why, you know, they're, they're seeing that most of their friends, colleagues, people they race against, and um, people they're reading about in, in the cycling literature, uh, that that's what they're getting. So that's something that's changed quite a bit. Uh, another injury that's managed a little bit differently in cyclists is PCL tears. So these, these are reasonably common injuries in cycling. Um, when, when folks crash, there's a tendency to land on the, on the point of the knee, um, obviously driving the tibia back and putting you at risk for, for PCL injury. Um, you know, the, the, the trend for these for a long time has been to not fix them, but there's still plenty of people, especially in um, in, in sports that require a lot of cutting, pivoting, changing directions. There's still some people that are getting um, reconstruction or repairs for, for PCL injuries. In cyclists, the, the world has completely moved away from repairing any of these. So, um, you know, if you see a cyclist after a crash coming in and uh, diagnosed uh, you know, PCL injury, uh, mo pretty much every time you're not gonna consider fixing these. These are not a problem on the bike. Um, the way the hamstring and the quad activates on the bike, really it's, it's, it's unnecessary. Uh, and people have moved away completely from repairing those. So those were the two that I wanted to talk about just real briefly because they um, are a little bit different in cyclists. Now that said, you know, like all the traumatic things that we see in every sport also happens in cycling, but a lot of that stuff carries over from the other settings that you're seeing those folks in. Um, so first of all, cycling's, cycling's common, right? So about 100 million Americans ride their bicycle, um, at least some, and about 5 million Americans ride their bike 20 days or more a month. Um, it's also reasonably dangerous, right? So when you compare it to other modes of transportation, when you compare it to other sports, it has a reasonably high incidence of uh, physician visits. So by one estimate, about 500,000 people end up visiting a physician yearly uh, due to a cycling-related injury and the cost of the healthcare system somewhere in the $30 billion range. So not trivial. We're all going to see cyclists. We're all going to see cyclists with traumatic injuries. We're all going to see cyclists with overuse injuries. Um, but despite all, all these traumatic injuries, all the things that we think about when we're watching cycling and the crashes that we see, uh, the vast majority of the problems that you see in cyclists are overuse injuries. And some of those are due to improper training, same types of training errors that we see in other sports. And some of that's due to bike fit. You know, cycling is reasonably unique in that you have three fixed points of contact with the bike and there's not a lot of other motion. Um, and it's a very repetitive activity. So an hour of cycling, for example, was about 5,400 pedal revolution. So a very repetitive motion sport. It's kind of amazing we don't see more overuse injuries. You know, give you know, any other task that you're doing 5,400 times an hour, um, you're, you're probably going to see even more overuse injuries. Knee injuries are the most common uh, over, overuse injuries, um, but it's not the most common thing that people complain about. So neck pain is the most common thing that people complain about. Uh, like I was saying, so we look at folks that are coming into the doctor to be evaluated, about half of them are complaining of something related to their neck, 40% complaining of something related to their knee. Groin and buttock complaints are also reasonably common. Um, hand injuries or, or, or paresthesias, uh, nerve compression syndrome is reasonably common. Um, and back pain, not so much back injuries, but back pain is also another reasonably common problem. So all things to be thinking about when the cyclist comes in through your door. Injury risk factors are reasonably similar to what they are in, um, in, in running. So uh, the more novice people do tend to get more overuse injuries, which is a little bit um, counterintuitive, right? You would think it's the folks that are doing more of these things that would be at higher risk for overuse injuries, but really it's the more novice cyclists. Um, so biggest injury risk factors are low weekly mileage. So people that aren't riding their bike much at all, people that really grind away in low gears, seems to increase um, decrease injury risk. Uh, the, the longer they've been cycling, the less likely they are to get an overuse injury, the slower they're cycling. So folks that um, you know, don't really have a, a super strong skill set on the bike yet, uh, those people are at increased risk of injury. And much like running, the more recreational someone is, the more likely they are to get hurt. The professionals are actually reasonably resilient. I mentioned this a minute ago, but cycling is fairly unique in its biomechanics. It's a purely sagittal plane sport. And it's got a partially closed genetic connect chain because you're attached at the, at the pedals. Um, this restricts your specific range of motion here, right? You have a fixed position at the, at the hands, at the feet, and at the hips. Um, and then when you're riding, power is transfer, transferred really in one way, and that's just transferring um, from, from, the, um, from the leg to the, to the pedal or cleat system. Um, and, and, you know, most other sports, even with running, you're getting some of your power from other types of body movement, right? So your, you know, your hip 
your hip shoulder counter rotation provides some of your power. Um, the way the way you um, you know, swing your arms, move the rest of your body, those things generate some of your power. But really in cycling, there's really just one source of power transfer. Um, so it makes for the, the biomechanics or kinetics of it to be reasonably simple, but also reasonably unique. And that's why we see some different injury patterns in, in cyclists. When we talk about pedaling, pedaling a bicycle, there's really two phases. So there's the power phase where you're pushing down on the pedal and there's the recovery phase where the pedal is coming back up and uh, behind you. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about riders who, who pull up on the pedal. Um, you know, one, one common cue that cycling coaches will give people is to pretend like you're scraping mud off the bottom of your shoe at the bottom of your pedal strokes, that you're using your hamstrings, you're recruiting your posterior chain a little bit to pull the pedal back up during that recovery phase. But really, when you look at, um, especially EMG data, the, the majority of the muscle activation is in that power phase. There's hardly any in that recovery phase. Um, just, just to kind of give you a, a graph of how we think about these things. So as you're moving through the crank cycle, we talk about the very top crank position as top dead center. We talk about the very bottom of the crank cycle as bottom dead center, about 25% you know, of the way in is 90 degrees and then the back phase is about 270 degrees. So this will come up as we're talking about some of these other things, but the commonly used terms are top dead center and bottom dead center. And different muscles are activated in different parts of this, uh, of, of the pedal stroke. And all of these things kind of make sense if you stop and think about them a little bit. Um, so obviously a, a good chunk of the power is coming from your quad muscles. As you can see, the quad muscles really activate heavily during the power, power phase of the cycle. Um, but then I think a lot of people forget that co-activation is also important for, for, for controlling your movement. So uh, even your hamstring muscles activate more in the uh, power phase of the cycle than they do in the recovery phase. So I think this is just a good graph to kind of remind us of some of the muscles that are recruited at different parts of the, of the pedal cycle and that the vast majority of this happens during the power phase um, and very little of it happens during the recovery phase. Uh, bike fitters will talk a lot about, about the angles that you expect someone to have on the bike. And these aren't set in stone, um, but it's good to have common nomenclature, common terms that we use when we're talking about these. So people will talk about the hip angle, which is really a measurement from the clavicle to the greater trochanter to the bottom back of the, of the bicycle itself. And most of the time you're shooting for somewhere around the 95 to 105 degrees um, uh, hip, hip angle. And then the knee angle is from the greater trochanter to the center of the knee to the lateral malleolus. And you don't have to remember this right now, but um, you know, normal for that is somewhere around 140, 150 degrees. And being less than that or being more than that can predispose you to certain injuries. So just to kind of illustrate this a little bit, um, this is a cyclist, um, uh, uh, Brendan Hardy's his name. He's a cat one, good, uh, good cyclist. Um, and so this is his position just for kind of cruising around. And you might notice that his hip angle is a whole lot wider than we were just talking about. So, you know, that's probably about 135, 140 degrees hip angle. So he's really wide open there, but that's not how he's riding when he's racing. Right. So when we're talking about his actual competitive position, it doesn't look like that. It looks like this. Right. So when he's competing, he's in the drops, he's sprinting through corners. He's, um, you know, he's mainly a crit racer and he's spending the bulk of his time here. And so that kind of 95 to 105 degree um, hip angle is, is, is pretty close to where he is in his preferred bike position. Um, and again, you can see that I'm measuring from the clavicle there to it doesn't help when I point at it, does it? So when I use my pointer here. We're measuring from the clavicle to his greater trochanter to the bottom of, or to the middle of the, um, of the crank at the bottom bracket there. So that's how we measure someone's actual hip angle on the bike. Similar with knee angle here, and here it matters a little bit less. His knee angle is going to be about the same um, whether he's sitting up on his hoods like he is here. This would just be a kind of cruising around position for a cyclist like this rather than a racing position. Um, but we're measuring again from the greater trochanter to the center of the knee to the lateral malleolus at bottom dead center of the pedal stroke. And he's probably pretty close to that, you know, 100, 140 degree angle that we're usually thinking of in someone um, with, a, with a good bike position. And these things hold true kind of regardless of what type of cycling you're doing. So uh, I, I think people forget that, you know, a time trial position when someone is really leaned forward on their bike they're really rotated forward on their bike. They're not really just leaning over their bars. And so you know, this is probably one of the most famous time trialists of all time is a guy by the name of Fabian Um, And as you can see, his both hip angle 
and knee angle are a lot like what we were just talking about, despite being on a very different type of bike and despite being doing it for a very different purpose. And so on a time trial bike, or even like thinking about some mountain bike positions, which are really slack or really open um, you know, for kind of trials or enduro type of riding, you know, those same, same types of angles kind of make sense and they kind of uh, maintain. It's just whether it's just where you are rotated on the bike. And so um, usually these same types of fit coordinates make sense regardless of the type of bike you're on. It just is if you're rotated forward, if your whole body is rotated forward, if your whole body is rotated back or for your more traditional cycling type of position. A lot of bike shops um, and some sports medicine uh, facilities will have tools to help you uh, measure these things, uh, to help, help you do fitting. There's a bunch of these on the market. Um, frankly, there's uh, fewer of them now than there were probably 10 years ago, just because smart trainers and some of the other things that are commercially available have kind of taken over this a little bit, makes it a little bit easier for the person at home uh, to modify their position, play around with things, take pictures. Now there's apps where you can you know, ride your bike on a trainer at home and, and use the app to measure your joint angles and, and use that to uh, advise you on position. Um, but, you know, if you're doing a lot of bike fit kind of stuff, it's worthwhile having a tool like this available. Now, these things get expensive very, very quickly, right? Like the, the retool um, bike fit system is somewhere around the $10,000 range. Uh, I don't think I have the other one on here, but these, these, these are expensive things. Most sports medicine clinics aren't going to have them, but there's a decent chance that you've got a bike shop in the community or, or at least within um, reasonable distance that has this type of tool available. Uh, we actually collaborate with a local bike shop when we need to do these things. If we're uh, you know, looking at someone's bike fit, we'll send them down to the local bike shop where they can actually do a, you know, the professional fit and go over things and they're able to report back with um, you know, the joint angles and, and, and specific positions that they're in that seem to optimize them. Um, and then we can make some tweaks in that to relieve some of their symptoms depending on what they're experiencing. So it's worthwhile either having access to something like this or knowing some place that does, right? Um, I, don't, I don't think um, most sports medicine clinics are gonna be investing in a $10,000 bike fit machine at this point. Um, but you know, there's still plenty of bike shops that have these things and collaborating with them can be a useful thing. Um, just like a lot of things in medicine or collaborating with the community makes a lot of sense sometimes. All right, so we're gonna start talking a little bit about how position can affect um, some of the, the complaints that athletes come into clinic for. So uh, one of the more common problems is, is patellofemoral pain. And it's a lot like what we see in runners and, and jumpers and in other sports. And in, in general, it's from excessive subpatellar load. And some of the same causes that we see in other settings apply here, right? So uh, we think about muscle imbalance here. We sometimes think about like underdeveloped VMOs. We think about people who are a little more quad dominant, a little less uh, hamstring control. Um, and so muscle imbalance can definitely play a role, not just with running, jumping sports, but also with cycling. People always say improper pedaling when they're talking about this. I honestly don't really know what that means. But if you read about this, people will talk about, you know, people with weird pedaling mechanics. Um, and that's probably some type of risk factor, but weird isn't a very useful term. Just, um, you know, beware of the person that just kind of looks funny on their bike. Uh, there's probably something about their pedaling mechanics that might be contributing. And then we'll talk about these things a little bit more here in the next couple of slides. Um, but with anterior knee pain in general, having a seat that's too low, having the saddle too low increases your subpatellar forces. Uh, and having a seat that's too far forward increases your subpatellar forces. So th those are things that we'll look at here in a couple of the next slides, see what that looks like. Um, riding in higher gears, so lower cadence with more load definitely increases the amount of load that the patellofemoral joint is seeing. And so sometimes just training people or helping people recognize that they need to be shifting a little bit earlier as they get into hills or to be start or start working on pedaling with a higher cadence can make a bit of a difference. Um, some places this is controllable, like I live in Iowa, it's mostly flat here. You know, we joke that, that the wind is our hills uh, here in Iowa, but um, some places like you're stuck riding straight up mountains and you, know, you might not have a lot of choice in what gears you're using if, um, if, if things are steep enough, but increased hill riding definitely increases your risk of um, patellofemoral pain on the bike. And then much like a lot of things, you know, the more someone's uh, training, what their training load looks like increases their risk um, here as well. I had this uh, slide on patellar tendinopathy here um, just because it's similar, but also a, a smidge too different. So if you look at the causes stuff, you're going to see uh, mostly the same things that we talked about on the previous slide, um, but you'll also see a comment here that lower lower extremity alignment can make a bit of a difference. And so there are some things related to cleat position that can affect this as well. We'll look at that here in a second in another slide as well. Um, but in general, you're thinking about kind of an adverse line of pull on the tendon, whether that's from the ground up, whether that's from um, 
cleat position, foot position on the pedal, or whether that's from um, you know, position on the bike itself. And so here's a great example of Brendan uh, riding with the saddle way too low, right? So you can uh, see that his you know, knee angle is barely getting to 90 degrees there, bottom dead center. Um, and this type of position really increases the load underneath the kneecap. If you don't believe me, you can play around with this yourself. Like if you take your bike out and you put the seat down a couple inches and ride around for a while, the front of your knee is going to start hurting. Um, this is one of the more common causes that uh, people who develop patellofemoral pain or patellar tendinopathy for that matter, um, one of the common things that sets them up for it. Um, usually it's not this dramatic, right? This is, this is really extreme just for the sake of illustration, um, but it's something to be thinking about and I think illustrates the point reasonably well. Lateral knee pain is a little bit different. Um, most of the time in cyclists, this is going to be IT band friction syndrome. So I, a lot of people think about these in different ways. I tend to think about IT band syndrome as, as three distinct entities. You know, I think about lateral snapping hip. I think about IT band friction syndrome with lateral femoral condyle. And then I think of insertional tendinopathy, uh, with the IT band insertion. Um, most of what we're seeing in cyclists is really IT band friction syndrome, um, where it's at the lateral femoral condyle and not so much that insertional tendinopathy. Um, much like in other sports, you know, muscular imbalances, people that are more quad dominant tend to get a little bit, a little bit more of this. Um, uh, like length discrepancies can put people at risk for this as well. So sometimes you have to pay attention to um, what they look like side to side as well. But from a position standpoint, um, athletes with their seat too far back or too high, meaning they're putting, um, you know, they're, they're, they're allowing kind of that IT band to uh, start to rub over the lateral femoral condyle at the bottom of their pedal stroke, those people tend to be at increased risk for this. And then just like we talked about with everything, training load can play into this as well. So here's just a kind of an example of how alignment can um, address these things. Um, th this, is, this is actually from an ad for some of the medial wedges that Specialized makes that you can use to change people's lower extremity alignment here. Um, and so, you know, in, in this particular case, the uh, drawing they're showing someone with, you know, excessive valgus alignment, um, you know, either anatomic or, or due to positional things, um, things like having too wide of a, of a Q factor or stance on the bike can make a slit your um, kind of in a functional valgus position. Um, certain saddles can kind of put, make it so that you're in a functional valgus position. Uh, but these things can be corrected, right? So you can do this from the pedal up by putting wedges in the shoes or shims in the shoes uh, or under the cleat for that matter to um, prop someone's medial knee up to, re to you know, reduce their valgus alignment or on the lateral aspect, reduce their varus alignment. And so when you see a cyclist who's complaining of medial or lateral knee pain for that matter, and they don't look like they've got um, normal straight sagittal plane alignment on the bike, you might wanna consider working from the bottom up because that's obviously, the, that's often the easiest way to deal with these things. Um, trying to deal with it with saddle changes or Q-factor changes, A, gets expensive super fast because that, that equipment is not cheap. You're talking about a $5 shim versus, you know, several hundred dollar crank set or a couple hundred dollar saddle in order to change someone's position. Um, and you can make a big difference here. Like just making some small changes in uh, someone's, someone's knee alignment on the bike can make a bit of a difference. Um, so feel free you know, feel free to play around with wedges if you see someone's alignment doesn't look quite right and they've got symptoms that would fit with uh, medial or lateral overload. Uh, hamstring pain or posterior knee pain uh, in cyclists is also pretty common. Occasionally, this will also present with anterior knee, anterior medial knee pain um, due to insertional tendinopathy at the pes anterior bursa. Um, it, again, similar causes to some of the things that we've talked about, uh, muscular imbalances, especially people that are really not uh, recruiting their glutes at the top of their pedal stroke. We think about those people. Leg length discrepancies definitely play a, um, play a role here. On the shorter leg, they have to reach more for the pedal. And so they're um, you know, recruiting their hamstring more at the bottom of the pedal stroke. And, um, and, and you may have to do something to prop one foot up or have asymmetric crank lengths in order to correct those types of things. Obviously, like many types of injuries, previous hamstring injuries, uh, increased risk of, of, of future hamstring injuries. This is actually more pertinent than you might think. You know, it sounds like an obvious statement, but it's not uncommon for people to transition to cycling as a bit of a cross-training modality when they're recovering from injuries. So there's a lot of runners who will get a hamstring injury and they'll make up for it by starting to ride, the, ride their bike more. And sometimes they can get other types of hamstring injuries just I want to be thinking about uh, hamstring injuries that have happened in, in other settings, not just 
on the bike um, because previous hamstring injuries are definitely a risk factor for having more hamstring problems uh, down the line. And then from a positional standpoint, having a seat that's too high or a seat that's too far back causing increased risk, increased reach, uh, and forcing you to recruit the hamstring more at the bottom of the pedal stroke makes a difference here. And so here's another example of Brendan on the bike um, work, working his way through a kind of pretty normal pedal stroke, but with the saddle way too high, right? So you know, we were talking about trying to get to somewhere around 135, 145 degrees of uh, knee extension at the bot bottom dead center of the pedal stroke. And here he's getting well past that, right? Like he's probably getting out to 160 or something like that. These things creep up on you. So unlike what we were talking about with the saddle too low being pretty obvious, pretty quick, uh, having a saddle that's, that's too high is one of those things that takes a while to start giving you trouble. So oftentimes you'll see cyclists say, oh, my position's been like this for years. I don't know why I'm getting posterior knee pain now. And you look at them and they, you know, they're, they're, they're clearly too high um, because these things don't happen overnight. These things happen slowly with, with repetitive use. Um, and so sometimes that takes a little bit more discussion. You know, it's usually pretty easy to convince someone to raise their saddle when they're getting anterior knee pain. It's a little bit more of a conversation when you're trying to get someone to move their saddle back down when they're getting posterior knee pain, hamstring tendinopathy, pes answering bursitis, things like that, or IT band syndrome for that matter, which also happens with the saddle too high. I don't have a great slide to, to demonstrate this, but the same thing happens if the saddle's too far back. And you can kind of imagine this, you know, imagine we brought him down uh, a few centimeters here, but then we moved him back a few centimeters too. You end up with the same type of problem with his knee extension, right? So having the saddle too far back is just as bad as having a saddle that's too high. It increases your reach to the pedal. It causes you to recruit your hamstrings a little bit more and also causes a little bit more friction where the IT band crosses the lateral thermal condyle. Uh, anterior hip pain luckily is pretty uncommon in cyclists. Um, it, it does come up from time to time, and this tends to be more personal factors than it does uh, position factors. So uh, folks with um, you know, bad, bad glute activation tend to get a little bit more of this. Um, people with worse hamstring strength are a little bit more quad dominant tend to get a little bit more of this. Um, but mobility, especially through the hips and the back, um, can, can definitely con contribute to anterior hip pain as well. Some of this is a little bit of anterior hip impingement. Cyclists do get labral tears, do get arthritis in their hips, just like other folks do. Um, but oftentimes by you know, working on core stability and core mobility, um, you can alleviate the factors that are putting them at risk for having pain with those things. So again, cycling is a sport where when folks have other injuries, they tend to gravitate towards it because it's less, less pounding. And so you might have older patients with hip osteoarthritis who you know, feel pretty good for a while, and then um, you know, they're, they're riding the bike and they start to get into your hip or into your groin pain. And you might have to work on some, some rehabilitative things to make sure they maintain the mobility and strength to um, be stable on their saddle uh, and, and protect the hip joint reasonably well. Um, really aggressive time trial positions also put you at risk for this. I think I have a slide here coming up that will demonstrate that. And then also people that are uh, with kind of excessive reach, meaning the handlebars are too far out in front of them, um, closes the hip angle a little bit, and that can definitely cause some pinching in the anterior hip as well. Uh, so this is an example of a really, really aggressive time trial position, um, you know, really closed hip angle here. You know, we, we were uh, talking before, but this, um, you know, this is Jordan Rapp, who is a former professional triathlete, works for, I think he works for either Strava or Zwift now, he does kind of in the cycling tech world. Anyway, so he was notorious for having a very aggressive time trial position and he's very closed at his hip here, right? So, you know, this might work for an elite athlete who's able to maintain this position for, you know, four or five hours like, like he did. Um, but, you know, for the typical cyclist, even you know, a good, good uh, recreational cyclist, this is not a sustainable position for most people. Um, you know, if, if this guy came in complaining of anterior hip pain, the first thing you're going to want to do is try to open up his hip angle and see if you can uh, de decrease some of the anterior hip, uh, anterior hip load. You know, if they really want to try to maintain an aggressive time trial position, you can move the whole thing forward, right? You can move his saddle forward, you move his arrow bars forward, and that will open up the hip angle for him. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be necessarily just raising the handlebars. You know, people that are trying to be competitive oftentimes are resistant to you know, coming up higher in the front because it puts you in a less aerodynamic position. Um, but for a guy like this, you know, coming forward with the saddle and coming forward with the arrow bars would open up his hip angle. So here's an example of Brendan just reaching too, too far. So we just slid his handlebars uh, far forward. And it's not super obvious in this, but you get a sense that his weight really isn't well distributed anymore, right? He has to use his arms a little bit more to kind of 
hold himself up. He has to, um, you know, close off his hip angle a little bit to maintain his pedal position or maintain his cycling position. Um, remember, this is kind of his cruise around position, right? So, you know, when we were talking about him earlier on, you know, this isn't a position that he would be be racing in, sitting up on the on the hoods like that. Um, but already he's getting pretty close to what we would consider a, a, a normal uh, hip angle. And so when he would go into the drops from a position like this, he would obviously be very, very close in his hip angle. So, um, you know, that's that's the way reach can affect us as well. It's not just where their saddle's positioned. Low back pain, also incredibly common in cyclists. Uh, a lot of this is the same type of things that we see in uh, other sports. So people that are you know, generally tight tend to get more, um, get more back pain. Core stability, core strength obviously gets a lot of attention. Leg length discrepancies causing this, the pelvis to rock back and forth when, when people are pedaling can make a bit of a difference here. Maybe we should stop for a second on that one. So that the, the issue there is, you know, if someone has a leg length discrepancy, um, they have to reach more on one side and on the other. So you can kind of imagine how uh, as they're reaching more with their short leg, their pelvis will kind of dip towards the short side. And then as they're reaching less with their, their longer side, it'll kind of raise on that side. And so you can kind of get this teeter-totter effect on the saddle when people have leg leg discrepancies. Uh, and that can lead to some unnecessary uh, coronal plane motion in the lumbar spine, which can cause pain. So you know, we'll always be on the lookout for leg length discrepancies in cyclists who are complaining of low back pain. Um, we talked about these a little bit before, but the saddle's too high or handlebars are too low. Uh, having to use your core stability just to maintain your position on the bike can definitely contribute uh, to people's um, back pain. And then having your seat too far back is um, very, very similar to having your seat too high. So same, same issue happens there. Um, and a trend that thankfully went away was what we called unilateral riding. So back in the day, a lot of cyclists would do one-legged drills where they'd ride for a long periods of time using only one of their legs. Um, and lots and lots of people got, got low back pain related to that. For the same reason we were talking about with leg length discrepancies, it gives you this kind of teeter-totter effect on the saddle, um, you know, because you don't have that counter force uh, on the other side to stabilize your pelvis and the other part of the pedal stroke. And so, you know, people's pelvis would tip up in the power phase and then it would tilt down in the recovery phase and tilt up in the power phase and tilt down in the recovery phase. And you get this coronal plane type of motion through the lumbar spine, which would lead to pain. Uh, luckily, that trend has kind of gone away. It was really popular. I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, people did that as part of their training and it really doesn't get the same type of attention that it used to. Um, most of the time, neck pain in cyclists is, is related to uh, position. So people riding with excessive neck extension, uh, even in time trial positions, you don't need to stick your head straight up in the air. This, this is actually a picture of my wife from about 20 years ago. Um, she'd probably kill me if she knew I was using this, this picture. Uh, we, we were doing a bike fitting session with her at one point, trying to get her to a reasonable position. And, um, you know, she, she had a tendency to put her head way up, way up in the sky. Um, and so when people are, are riding, even in a time trial position, you don't need a lot of neck extension in order to be able to see up the road. So People talk about this kind of turtling position where you're still keeping your head down, but eyes up to keep your neck in a more neutral type of position. This is oftentimes a limiter in people in ultra endurance types of events. So um, I, one, one year uh, with Race Across America, which is a stupid race where people try to go across the entire United States as quickly as possible. That was the number one people, number one reason that people withdrew from the race was, um, was, was due to neck pain. They just weren't able to maintain the position um, you know, for, for hundreds of hours or whatever it is to ride across the United States as quickly as you can. Thoracic mobility can play a, a role here as well, um, or at least people talk like it is. You know, there's plenty of cyclists with poor thoracic mobility. I can't say that I've ever really seen a cyclist that came in complaining of neck pain and they, you know, I can't kind of determine that it was poor thoracic mobility that set them up for it, but it's one of those things that's described in bike fitter manuals. And if you go in for a professional bike fit, that's one of the things they'll probably assess is what your thoracic mobility looks like. The argument being that if you don't have great thoracic mobility, you might need a higher handlebar position in the front just to maintain a neutral neck position. Um, having your saddle too far back puts you in the same type of problem, right? So it closes off the hip angle. You have to lift up your head more, a little bit more stress on the neck, making it harder to maintain a neutral neck position. Same thing with the handlebars too low, right? So if, if your bars are too low and you need to be able to uh, see up the road, you have to lift your, your head up quite a bit. And then we talked about this a little already, but time trial positions um, are notorious for this. There's a lot of time trialists or triathletes out there, um, you know, who, who don't really find a good way to keep their neck in a neutral position while they're riding. So neck pain is reasonably common uh, and can definitely be associated with fit or mobility issues. 
All right, so those are the main bike fit things I wanted to get through. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, about neuropathies that happen in cyclists. Uh, as a reminder, there's three points of contact on a bicycle, right? So your, your hands are on the handlebar, your, your butt is on the saddle, and then your feet are on the pedals. And all three of these things can lead to um, compression neuropathies. So um, you know, in, in the hand, you can get both ulnar and median neuropathies, um, you know, much similar to car carpal tunnel syndrome or ulnar compression neuropathy. Um, on the saddle, uh, there's a lot that's talked about with pudendal neuropathy, uh, especially its association with erectile dysfunction. And we'll get to that here in a, a little bit more in a second, um, but saddle numbness or genital paresthesias are, re are really a, a, num a, a neuropathy, um, oftentimes associated with bike fit or saddle choice. Uh, and again, we'll walk through that here in just a little bit more detail. And then one that I think gets overlooked quite a bit, but is a reasonably common complaint are foot paresthesias. The interdigital nerves have a tendency to get compressed with each um, each pedal stroke, especially with um, modern modern pedal systems that don't have a very big platform on them. Um, and there's some things that you can do with the shoe or the pedal to reduce the risk of that. So when we're talking about ulnar or median neuropathies in, in the hand. Um, you know, padding is really uh, your best friend here. So using padded gloves or using bar tape is, us is usually the best way um, to protect this. The other ways you could do that are to do things with bike position to unload the hands, right? So if you move the hands further forward, if you move the handlebars further forward, you can't put quite as much weight on your hands. You have to have more weight on your saddle in order to do that. So moving your weight rearward can be useful in taking some of the pressure off your hands if people are complaining of, um, of, um, of median or ulnar neuropathy symptoms in their hands. The other way to do this is to pedal harder, right? So if more of your force, more of your weight is being transmitted to the pedals and less of it is on your butt and on your hands, you actually get fewer of these other types of symptoms. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit with pudendal neuropathy as well. But this tends to be a problem of more recreational cyclists. You know, most people who are um, racing and riding hard don't get quite as much of this. By far the most common bike fit problem that sets people up for this is too short of a reach. More of their weight is up on their hands, less of their weight is on the pedals and on the saddle. Um, so having too short of a reach to the handlebars uh, is the thing to be looking for from a bike fit um, standpoint. So here's just an example of Brendan on the bike with way too short of a reach. And you can kind of imagine here that he has to put a lot more of his weight on the palms of his hands to maintain this position. Um, you know, he's otherwise in a pretty good position there, um, but with the reach too short, more of the weight is coming up on his hands. Um, and this will put him at risk for median neuropathy and older neuropathy. Uh, pudendal neuropathy is mainly a, a neurologic compression, but people talk about it as a neurovascular um, compression problem because there does seem to be some associated uh, some association with um, sexual dysfunction as well, um, and at least theoretically, um, you know, nerve compression syndromes there shouldn't really put you at risk for erectile dysfunction or other sexual dysfunction. Uh, it's a so it's a neurovascular compression syndrome between the saddle and, and the pubis, um, and most people will present with some type of numbness. So they might have perineal numbness, they might have actual genital numbness, where they complain of of actual numbness in their penis scrotum or or, or, or genitals. Um, uh, men get talked about more often than women do for this, but this is actually more of a common problem in, in female cyclists. Best data on this is about two to one women to men. So um, you know, we, we should probably be thinking about women with this more. I think men get more attention because of the association with erectile dysfunction, but this is actually more of a, um, more of a common problem in women than it is in men. Lots of ways to fix this. Um, one that a lot of people spend a lot of time and a lot of money trying to do is trying to find the right shorts for them, trying to find the right cycling shorts that will actually protect them and not give them numbness. And that is a complete waste of time because this is almost never a chamois problem or a problem with, with the attire that they're wearing. This is almost a problem with, with, the, with the saddle, uh, how you're sitting on the saddle or really casual riding. So if you're pedaling very easily, a lot of your weight is on your butt. There's a lot more compression here. If you're pedaling harder, there's less weight there. People get a lot less of this stuff. And then there's all kinds of saddles on the market that are designed to take the pressure off of the pedendal nerves here. Um, I, this is just one example on, on the right of your screen here. Uh, this is some company called ISM. Uh, it has a kind of a cutout in the front and your ischial tuberosities just sit on those two little prongs that are hanging off the front of it rather than having a full saddle. So there's nothing that could really press on your neurovascular bundle um, in, in, in your groin. Um, but there's lots of other things like saddle cutouts, um, saddles that are really meant to be ridden a little more far forward. Um, that, that's been a big trend lately. You know, these ones with no nose have not really 
really taken off, but a lot of companies are making very short saddles now uh, with very pronounced areas for your ischial tuberosities to sit on so that most of the weight is on the ischial tuberosities and hardly any of the weight is on the other soft tissues of the pelvis. So lots of different saddle options out there. A walk into a local bike shop talking about this, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll find lots of good options. Uh, th this was a huge topic back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, some of this started with um, an article in, in Bicycling Magazine um, that claimed that there were 100,000 people uh, out there with permanent erectile dysfunction from cyclists. Um, and there was a line in that article, there are two types of cyclists, those who are impotent and those that will be. I want to be really clear that this is um, not true at all. And we'll talk about some of the other data, but it's also not a new idea, right? So Hippocrates wrote about the constant jolting of their horses, making men unfit for intercourse. So like this whole idea of prolonged sitting and um, pudendal or, or neurovascular compromise causing erectile dysfunction and causing um, other sexual dysfunction is not a new concept. Um, it just really got a lot of attention in the late 90s, early 2000s. So there was a bunch of studies after that. I'm just picking two here, kind of cherry picking a little bit. Um, Taylor in 2004 had 688 cyclists um, and then a bunch of match control and the same rates of erectile dysfunction um, by age in these cyclists as there was in the general population. And as far as they could find, there was no association at all with any cycling rated variable. So you know, how hard they ride, um, their power outputs, their time in the saddle, what saddle they were using, the only risk factor for erectile dysfunction in cyclists seemed to be age, just like it is in the general population. Um, and then uh, another one that got a fair amount of attention was summer study in 2001, which is smaller, only 40 men, um, but they measured the partial pressure of, uh, of uh, oxygen in, the, uh, in and around the, um, the, the, soft, the perineal soft tissues um, and found that there was a decrease in, in, in blood, blood flow to that area when people were, were cycling. So it decreased by about two thirds in a seated cycling position. Um, but within that group and in a kind of cohort interview that they did along with it, um, everyone that developed erectile dysfunction uh, that seemed to come from cycling had some association with general numbness. So there's plenty of, of warning sign ahead here. So um, for anyone who, who's experienced this general numbness on a bike, it's not a subtle finding. Like this is not something that you find yourself scratching your head thinking, oh, do I have that? Do I not have that? You're like, holy crap, something's really wrong there. I got to gotta change something. And so there's plenty of warning here. There doesn't seem to be any risk of erectile dysfunction in folks that are not experiencing general numbness. And most people will do something to change their position or, or change something if they're getting substantial general numbness on the bike. Uh, also, interestingly, in this group that uh, even though there were people reporting both general numbness and um, erectile dysfunction, there wasn't any difference um, compared to age-based age, uh, age norms. Uh, last pair of seizure we're going to talk about are hot spots or, or, or numb toes in the feet. So these are interdigital nerves uh, compressed by the metatarsal heads. They get compressed with every single pedal stroke. So that's just part of the nature of riding a bike, the way the foot uh, kind of deforms a little bit uh, uh, when force is applied to the pedal, compresses the interdigital nerves. And people complain about hot spots in their, in their foot. Um, these can be caused by a lot of different things. So the um, plat pedal platform, cleat platform that someone's using, uh, how tight their shoe is, um, stiffer cycling shoes seem to be a risk factor for this. Uh, so a lot of different, um, different causes here. And so you want to talk to your athletes about wearing proper shoes and pedals uh, for their goals, right? I mean, like I, I do a fair amount of racing and when I'm racing, I wear these super stiff carbon fiber shoes that are you know, pretty sore on my feet, but um, you know, allow me to transfer a little bit more power to the pedals. You know, if my goals were different, if I was you know, trying to ride around town and do recreational rides, I probably don't need something quite that stiff. The other thing that can be done here that's pretty useful is using some type of arch support with a metatarsal button because that spreads out the uh, metatarsal heads. You can kind of imagine this. Um, I don't know if you guys can see my video, but like if we're thinking about my metatarsal heads like this, if I put a little button underneath that to raise up between my metatarsal heads, it spreads them apart and takes some of the pressure off the interdigital nerves. So several of these on the market. This is just one that I, I happen to like. These are the specialized body geometry ones. And it's hard to tell from the picture, but there's an extra little bump in this part of the insert that raises up the metatarsal heads in the middle to spread them out to take some of the pressure off the interdigital nerve. So if someone's complaining of a lot of hot spots, this is one of the first things I recommend is using some type of cycling shoe insert that has um, a metatarsal button.
The other thing that's important is your actual pedal position. Um, so a good, a good rule of thumb is about a centimeter behind a, a line that goes um, through your first MTP joint. So if you draw a line straight across through the MTP joint, putting the center of the pedal about a centimeter behind there is a good starting spot for most people. You also want most of the weight transfer to be somewhere in the middle of the foot. You don't want it to be too far medial. You don't want it to be too far lateral, uh, but somewhere in the middle of the foot, about a centimeter behind the first metatarsal um, or the, the first MTP joint. Um, this is trial and error though. Right. I mean, that's a good place to start. That's not a hard and fast rule. So, you know, having people kind of start there and then adjust their cleat position to find a position that's more comfortable for them makes a lot of sense. Um, a lot of cyclists will play around with cleat position for years until they find something that works well for them. And then they are married to it. Like, you know, they draw all kinds of lines on their shoes when they're changing cleats just to make sure they get things exactly where they were before. Because once you find a position that works for you, it tends to keep working. Uh, last topic we're going to hit out here is bone health. Uh, so there's really no debate on this anymore. Cyclists have lower bone mineral density than athletes who do weight, um, weight bearing sports. Uh, and this makes a lot of sense, right? When you're, um, when you're, when you're running, you're supporting your own weight, right? There's not something else that's su supporting you. Um, there's a lot of high impact, your ground reaction forces, um, in your legs are like two and a half times your body weight and in your spine, it's like one, 1.75 times your body weight. So there's a lot of load associated with cycling or with, with running. Um, and this is good for bones, right? I mean, bones need to be loaded in order to be strong in cycling. On the other hand, um, you know, it's a weight supported sport, a good chunk of your weight is on your saddle or on your hands. There's no real impact. And even when someone is pedaling reasonably hard, so if, if you're pedaling at about um, 250 50 watts at 90 RPM, you're still only seeing about 50% of your body weight through the pedal, even, even when you're pedaling really, um, really fairly hard on a bike. Um, there are only short-term studies to follow us over the uh, follow the changes during a cycling season. So uh, honestly, the best one of these only had 14 amateur cyclists in it. So this is um, Barry from 2008 had 14 amateur cyclists, um, you know, kind of kind of older older group, but still there's a fair number of competitive cyclists in that age group, and they followed them over one season. And over that one season, their um, bone mineral density in their hip decreased by 1.5%. They also saw a trend in uh, decreased bone, ben bone density in their lumbar spine. Um, and then it was hard to tell if it actually recovered during the off season. And so there's just a graph of the findings from, from that paper. So lumbar spine, slight trend towards a decrease in bone mineral density. Hip clearly um, reached statistical significance. Um, nine months into the season here uh, with some recovery as they moved into the off season, similar in the femoral neck, similar um, at, at the greater trochanter, similar at the femoral shaft. So even over a fairly short period of time, it's possible to see changes in people's bone mineral density if cycling is their primary sport. So we always encourage our cyclists to supplement their cycling with some other type of load bearing exercise just to help them maintain um, good bone health. Um, certain populations that's um, more important than others. You know, you, we see female athlete triad issues in cyclists, just like we do in other sports. And those people are particularly high risk for poor bone health. So we want to make sure that those people are uh, supplementing their cycling with some type of weight bearing exercise uh, to help them maintain as good a bone mineral density as they can. And that's all I had. Uh, hopefully we saved enough time for a question and answer here. We've got about 10, 15 minutes left. Uh, happy to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Great. That was wonderful. Um, so while I allow some time for some questions to come in, I just wanted to highlight that there is a survey in the chat function just to help give us feedback on how we can customize these lectures to um, each of the learners. Um, but I wanted to kick off the questions by asking, you know, it, you did a lot of comparison to running, um, and I didn't know if there was any optimal cadence that you recommend um, or, you know, um, strokes per minute that you would recommend for a novice cycler in order to kind of figure out what their appropriate level of resistance is, especially if they're with the increase in uh, home exercise with home stationary bikes. Yeah, so there's no right answer to it. Um, there are some older studies suggesting that injury risk was lowest with a cadence of somewhere around 90 RPM. Um, that you know has not been replicated very well, and frankly, those studies are getting to be 30, 40 years old at that point. So it's it's kind of hard to know. 
Um, I do think that some modern training software makes a big difference here, right? So most modern training software plans that use your power meter and, and can measure your cadence at the same time can give you something called a quadrant analysis. So you can see where you're applying the most power, most force, and can help most cyclists kind of figure out their optimal cadence. Um, you know, so, so for like me, when I look at my quadrant analysis after a race, you know, typically somewhere around 93 is where I'm putting out the most power for the longest period of time. And frankly, our bodies are pretty smart, right? So, you know, what seems to be physiologically optimal is usually what your body wants to do. So, you know, if someone's really sophisticated with their cycling analysis software, has a power meter, is able to do these types of things, then it's useful using these quadrant analysis tools to try to evaluate that. If you don't, you know, starting at 90 and seeing how it feels seems okay. like a reasonable approach. Okay, that's great. Do you ever use that quadrant oh, analysis? Yeah which I should yeah. add is similar to running, right? So like optimal running cadence right. seems to be around 180, right? right? But that's for both legs, right? And so it right. ends up 90 per leg. So it ends up being a similar cadence to optimal cadence and running. Do you ever use those quadrant analyses to fake, to correlate with the most active muscle during the pedal stroke to help kind of weak um, muscle strength and therefore improve uh, performance? Um, I don't. I, I suspect there are people that do, right? Because there, there's a lot of conversation about uh, folks that are generally fit, but are kind of poor climbers, especially climbing out of the saddle and their muscle recruitment patterns, and whether they'd be better trying to ride at a lower cadence when they're climbing, so they can activate their glutes a little bit more, or if they're better off trying to ride at a higher cadence when they're climbing, so they can activate their quads and hamstrings a little bit more. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I don't do, I don't dive into that stuff at all. It's definitely something cycling nerds talk about. Um, mm -hmm. There's the right answer as far as I can tell. Um, one question that came up is how can um, those interested get involved with supporting professional amateur cyclists as a physician? Yeah, so show up to local races and volunteer to do the medical because every race is looking for someone to do medical. It's always a big pain in the butt for these small local races to do it. And you don't need to really have that much. Um, I mean, you got to have basic trauma expertise. You don't really need specific cycling expertise because you're mainly dealing with crashes and road rash and things like that but boy it is incredibly easy to get involved in the cycling uh, medicine community because every little race needs someone there to help them if there's an injury if there's a crash if there's a medical emergency that takes place so they would be more than happy to to have you <laughs> most races are scrambling at the last minute to try to find anybody who will come and help out right i think the next question that came in is regarding how um, when you have common injuries for cyclists, I think that the question is, is how do you advise them to add in running? Um, and Jennifer, if you have any more clarification so I can better phrase that for you. Um, it, it looks like a patient who has some anterior based knee pain and some pes planus tight hamstrings kind of, is it how you would counsel them on cycling? Oh, no, just a uh, common uh, injuries you see in cyclists that are starting to add in running so either cyclists mm -hmm. that have decided they want to um for example start taking up triathlons i just had a patient today that's an avid cyclist has his bike fit perfectly um significant like pen pes planus and some hamstring like mild tightness with anterior medial knee pain he seems to have like patellofemoral syndrome more of a picture than any kind of tendonitis i was just interested dr peterson like specifically for those athletes kind of making that tra uh, transition um, to either adding in running or adding in like triathlon type work, what you might see. Yeah, so some, someone coming from a cycling background to triathlon is likely going to be pretty quad dominant in their running pattern, right? And we definitely see more patellofemoral stuff in those. And we also see more hamstring stuff in, in those folks as well, right? So I don't think you should be surprised if your person is transitioning from cycling to more of a, of a running um, based activity. Uh, struggles a little bit with patellofemoral pain or with hamstring problems just because those are not you know the dominant muscles for most of what what you're doing on, on the bike so um you know similar like we see in young athletes sometimes right i mean we talk about our, our our especially ball and team sport athletes who are more quad dominant having more trouble with patellofemoral pain same thing happens here and so if you see someone with really weak hamstrings or the way they move is really in a quad dominant pattern you know it's worthwhile doing some hamstring rehab or some gait training stuff for those folks like there's there's physical therapy things that can make a real difference for them
I would say that they're lower hanging fruit from a rehab standpoint than your typical patellofemoral patient because there's usually things that can actually be corrected. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, what about seeing things like ischial bursitis in a cyclist? Yeah, so it definitely happens. Um, I think it gets blamed more than uh, than it, it deserves. So um, you definitely you see it sometimes. You can see it on ultrasound. You can see it on MRI sometimes. Um, but I think more often than not, it's either just like bony irritation. Someone with posterior hip pain, even if in clinic and in exam, it, it really behaves like it. Cause I think it's reasonably uncommon in this population. Um, I think most of the time you're dealing with proximal hamstring stuff instead of an actual true um, posterior impingement or um, ischial bursitis. Now that said, if you need to know, you take a look, right? I mean, you can MR them. If they're skinny enough, you can ultrasound them. You can get a good look at it. So we've got tools to be able to evaluate these things if we need to. Um, and then when you talk about putting wedges in um, cycling shoes, do you have a general uh, recommendation of the initial uh, degree you correct or kind of thickness you correct to add in? Yeah, so luckily most of the ones on the market are two and a half degree wedges. So that's by far the most common um, thing that you start with. And then you can kind of stack on top of that. So I'll usually start with like two and a half degrees. And, you know, if that seems like it's enough, great. If it seems like you could do more than you stack a second one on. It's pretty rare to go past like seven and a half degrees, but most of the ones on the market are two and a half degree ones anyway. Great. Um, any, I mean, those were the questions that came through. Any final words of wisdom you want to share with us or any other um, pearls that you have? No, I mean, yeah, it's a lot like other sports, right? A lot of cyclists want to find a way to get back on the bike. And one nice thing about how indoor training has progressed over the past, um, you know, over, over the past 10 years is that with a lot of injuries, people can get back on the, on the bike pretty soon, especially upper extremity injuries. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to have our athletes in a, in a cast on the, on the trainer, right? Like, um, so you want to make sure you're talking about what the, what their goals are and that you're using appropriate materials and supplies and things like that. They need a surgery, make sure their surgeons know that, you know, whatever they're using as a splinter or brace is probably going to get sweaty in this person. And mm-hmm. we got to be thoughtful about, you know, and counseling them on maintaining a clean environment and, and those types of things. But, um, you know, for good, better or worse, technology has made it easier for cyclists to get back on the bike quickly after, especially upper extremity injuries. And I think a lot of us kind of forget that sometimes that these people are going to be getting back on their bike and you got to be thinking about how you can protect them best you can. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. This was awesome. Um, I know we all learned a lot and lots of really great, um, important things for the CAQ. So thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, guys.